Hello, welcome back to day two of Config 2023 and the final sessions we have for you all. Hard to believe it's almost over, right? Well, let's make the most of it and make these sessions the best ones yet. Now, helping close this off is Natalia, who is a research scientist at MIT Lab. Now, probably not that many people can claim that the devices they've designed have been used in space, but Natalia sure can, and I'm super excited to hear her speak. So let's give Natalia a warm welcome to the stage. Hi, everyone. So happy to be here, and thanks for making it to the final, final session of today. Indeed, we're going to talk about space and much more. And while you're still wondering, why are we talking about this? After a whole day of talking about AI, well, guess what's going to happen? We're going to talk about the key enabling technology, without which neither AI, true AI, nor AGI will not be possible. Brain-computer interfaces. The brain, your brain, the brain of your user. Mind control at MIT, how to design the next generation of brain-computer interfaces. Why should you care? Well, because we are having a lot of devices around us, on us. Think about those sleep trackers you're wearing, those fancy rings, or the bracelets that track your fitness levels and your heart rate and uh, all of the other activities. They're getting closer and closer to your bodies and they're getting more and more insights about your body. And now, with the ability of us having head-worn devices, I'm wearing just one right now, I can see a lot of you wearing some types of caps, eyeglasses, headphones. We can have an insight about what your user thinks, what your user wants. But let's get back maybe 25 years ago, when little Natalia saw one of her most favorite movies, Johnny Mnemonic, 1995. Oh yeah, that's an old classic. Look at this Keanu Reeves. 320 gigabytes of antivirus in his brain against a pandemic that is called nerve attenuation syndrome. Guess against what that is. It's because people are spending too much time in virtual reality. Uh, doesn't it remind you of something? Just saying. And of course, there is this amazing cybernetically enhanced dolphin just in there with a brain implant. Ask my husband, I still want to do this one day. I really want to have this dolphin. And of course, all of those screens, they mesmerized Natalia, and that's how I even got into computer science. But fast forward 15 years later, another interesting movie got out. Let's take a look. You always have to wake up. They can fix a spinal if you got the money. But not on vet benefits, not in this economy. A VA check in 12 bucks will get you a cup of coffee. I'm what they call waitlisted. Some could argue this reminds you of today's San Francisco. I would totally agree this reminds me for that 12 bucks coffee, that's for sure. However, yeah, James Cameron hit it real close to home, and I'm ready to argue that this is the reality we are building right now. And before we discuss how not to settle into this reality and what technology can help us, let me just real quick introduce myself. I have been doing brain-computer interfaces for my whole professional life and career, starting 
from actually high school. And a lot of companies, organizations, and nonprofits have supported my work throughout the years. So this is just a shout out to them. But let's get back to the cool stuff, to the brain. We're going to be talking about non-invasive brain-computer interfaces today. And I'm going to be using the term BCI throughout this talk. That's what it means. But that's what usually happens when I tell everyone what I'm doing. That's the face, and that's the, uh, the question. What I'm actually doing is brain reading. I'm trying to understand what happens in your brain, what are those electrical activities that flow, synapses, but also do a bit of mind reading. I try to understand what happens to your brain when you look at something, when you desire something, when you're afraid of something. And so brain reading is not the same as mind reading. I'm going to give you the examples of the talks of this two throughout this talk. Let's start actually right now. I can see around like 20% of heads here down because you're looking into your digital screen in your phone, in your tablet. I understand you're about to check in on your flight, get your arrangements for your dinner. I understand that. But guess what? Your brain really still doesn't like digital. I know it has been like, what, 60 years we are living in digital world? Still doesn't like it. Seven types of memory are activated when you are using paper notes or paper book. That's why in all of those hotels we are all staying, we have a lot of fancy printouts. A lot of menus are still on the print. Only three types of memory activated when you're using a digital tablet. And, of course, our magic unicorn chat GPT, spoiler alert, your brain likes it even less. Yeah, check, uh, visit us in Boston. Um, we're going to tell you more. You can even be part of our study. <laughs> oh. However, now with each single major company out there releasing their own hardware, I don't need to run after my user convincing them to put something on the head. That's already done. We have now these devices, and you can wear them. So not a single person here actually wears an XR headset, but that's for a bit later in this talk. However, even with all of those devices available and purchasable, of course, what we have an issue as brain scientists is to now deal with the aftermath of what all of those devices have done to your brain. And they have done a lot of damage, like a lot. All of the devices around you that you're using creating and form your habits, good and bad. Let's give just a simple example to start with from the physical world. When you're going shopping, would play this song for maybe a bit more. There would be 91% probability that you wouldn't end up this evening buying a bottle of French wine getting a glass of French wine, a French dessert, or going to a French restaurant altogether. I just primed you unconsciously with the music to get something French. That's a very easy one. It's usually called neuromarketing. No one likes it. You are the permanent victim of it. <laughs> However, of course, unfortunately, jokes aside, of course, there are much more nefarious examples. The feet that totally eats down all of your dopamine and makes you fully addicted. Or hopefully none of you here are being part of designing these deceptive patterns. But I'm pretty sure you as all users have seen or have been victim of at least one. All in all, your brain is a slave of your devices. You are not in control of your devices. They are in control of you. So how can we get this control back? What should we do? Should we like break these bad habits, design only for good habits? What should we do? What we can do and how can we actually design the systems for the betterment of humanity? I would argue that we need to look into spaces. I know, spaces, Bay Area, whole June 2023 was about spaces, especially the beginning of the month. Uh, spaces in the context of spatial computing, the terms that my lab coined around 30 years ago. 
but I would argue that we need to look at the spaces in the context of the brain and brain interaction. Because you exist outside of your screens. And more importantly, you use a bit more than just your eyes or voice or your hands to interact with your devices. Though most of design kind of tries to convince you otherwise. Let's give some examples. We are here in the Moscone Center. And guess what? No one liked yesterday to go to their hotel room and to watch those talks in the room. You wanted to be here. You wanted to be present, connected with your peers. Some of us are connected over Zoom, watching those talks. Hey, virtual audience. And also they were in their brain sensing devices to support their attention levels. Some of us are driving and wearing their brain sensing devices to support their state and not to fall asleep. Some of us are enjoying a walk with our parents in a park and making sure that the brain sensing device will give us insights if there are any early signs of cognitive decline. Some of us are facing a lot of health challenges and use those devices to have supported communication at the hospital. Some of us are just beginning this journey on Earth and enjoying their playtime and growth mindset while wearing the brain sensing devices. And some of us are already in between the worlds, digital and real. Here in this example, a user is imagining a soccer ball, and that soccer ball appears on the screen in front of them. They are thinking in their head about a red square, and it appears on the screen in front of them. This is done using brain activity only. We call this what you think is what you get. And some of us, uh, as the host mentioned, are actually not even on this Earth altogether. They are in space. They are working to move us away and move our civilization away to other planets. And they have earned their brain sensing devices to make this happen. All in all, brain interaction is everywhere. But how can we make it commonplace? Well, for this, we need to go a bit deeper. And I would say specifically maybe 10 years ago, I call this Natalia and her octopus era. This is a common state of brain sensing that you would see in scientific publications. Tons of electrodes and the first design lesson here just for you, just for free. Don't wear makeup and nice dresses to the BCI lab ever. That's gonna end real bad, like real bad panda eyes, not working. Or oh, another one, Natalia in her fMRI era, in addition to ridiculous headset I have, which is also an EG headset, I have that $1.5 million machine behind me, which I'm gonna lay down and enjoy, Sars Carson here, my time in, in cold. And guess what, yeah, your user is not gonna wear those or have those, so you don't have easy access to any of those. So what we needed to do is go through the evolution that the personal computers have undergone from the mainframes to the computer that is the size of the palm of our hand. And we have done that. We have built a suite of variable wireless devices that look very similar and actually same as your everyday headwear. The cost on one device like this is equal to one session in fMRI. And unlike fMRI, you can still enjoy your coffee and your morning newspaper while wearing it. And it would make possible for this to come true. Let's watch another video. The new op center is over here. That just came online. These swarm assemblers, they can put up a building in six days. We have done more here in a year than in the previous 30 years. Not... Here we see at least three different BCI enhancements. We see the avatar one, we see the exoskeletons, and we also see the swarm of those robots that are ready to do different tasks for us. This was in 2023, and we actually got our hands also in 2023 on one of the very similar robots. And 
uh, which what we have built with it. Do you want me to go to the kitchen? Yes. Do you want me to meet you at the living room? Yes. All in all, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All in all, each single device we build is making our life healthier and longer. That's what all of those devices are for. However, I'm ready to argue that with each single device, our brain is having harder and harder time to understand them, to work with them. They are getting more and more cognitively demanding, mentally demanding. With now the arrival of the BCI on the market, we are hopeful to not alleviate the challenges of all of those previous devices, but also with enablement of AI, we can hopefully build a true empathetic AGI. AGI will not be possible without BCI. If you want to build a system that truly understands us as humans, if you want to truly aim for a fusion between the human brain and the computer brain to evolve in possibly another species. Think about it. If we take just large language models, we have been talking earlier today, is there a system, LLM-based, that would be able to understand a person that is fully paralyzed, the person that cannot talk, cannot move, cannot do anything with their body. And guess what? There are a lot of people who are either born with no voice or are losing the voice or ability to talk towards the end of their lives because of the accidents. A limb will be there for nothing. You need the system that is truly understanding the human brain. And BCI is a key enabling technology for this to happen. But same as LMs are booming right now because of the hardware and language data, we are aiming for the same with BCIs. More specifically, we are just getting into hardware evolution to ensure that the devices we are creating and varying can effectively pick up brain activity while staying variable. Your face masks, your eyewear, your airports, all of those you are already wearing on your head. And this can be easily enhanced with brain sensing. Here are some of the iterations of the device we have been building for the past seven years at MIT. We call it Attentive View. This is a pair of glasses. On the bridge of the nose, there are sensors that can pick up your eye movements with no use of cameras. It's based on the electrical activity from your eyes moving. On the side of the ears, we are picking up brain activity. And the device is fully manufactured in the United States. We have material, electrical, mechanical, graphical design, all of those together to build this device. However, I have some news. Seven years later and X million dollars later, it's not enough to build hardware. 
you also need to think about the ecosystem for it. 97% of all of the software support for BCI systems are desktop only. You're not going to go to space with a desktop, believe me. No, not going to happen. You need to think about mobile solutions, edge solutions, embedded solutions that we are building. And again, some of the news, software alone is not enough to understand humans. After building AI and ML systems for the past 15 years, I can tell you that we need a lot of data. And unlike LLMs, compared to LLMs, we in our BCI world, we do not have data. Like literally, if we are to compare the amounts of data we're right now having with these devices. However, even though we cannot read your thoughts yet, in part because we don't have enough data yet, we can already augment the spaces that you interact with. We have been talking throughout this, this talk and also for the past two days about building habits. What BCI does is not some add-on that you will use in your design systems. It's something that's going to overedge any of your designs. It's going to be that step zero that you would include to actually help your user and support them. Because we focus on what the user wants, what the user needs before the user knows it. Think about poker. We can tell if you are cheating, if you're going to bluff, if you're going to be cooperative between two to seven minutes before you're going to ever make a move. And this is just one of the examples. So how do we do this? We do a lot of measurements. Some of you are using eye tracking, but we measure everything. Eye movements, example I just gave you, brain activity, and can you all stand up, please, for a second? Yay, awesome, thank you. Some of the blood flow to your brain, but also thank you, you can take a seat. <laughs> it actually spiked your attention like for five, seven minutes, and by five to 17%, just the blood flow. So yeah, I'm working, working my talk. But what is more important is that 75 muscles in your body got activated for you to lift. If only one would fail, you would just fall to the ground. But your brain took minimal time to actually hear what I'm asking and then executing or non-executing what I was asking for. It's called muscle activity. We also measure it. And more importantly, we measure it when you sleep. One third of our lives we spend Sleeping. Think about a user experience as the lens of one third of one's life. That's a dream. What we are doing is we can interface subconsciously with the NREM1 stage of sleep. For those of you who have those fancy sleep trackers, you might know NREM1 is rapid eye movements, is that early stage of sleep. We have designed a system at the lab that is similar to a system from the 16th, 17th century used by Dali, Einstein, Tesla. When they were falling asleep, they were having a metal ball in their head. And then, when they fall asleep, the ball will fall, they will wake up, and they will take a pad and write down all of those ideas. We have done the same system, except of the metal ball in the hand. We are using the app that will talk to you in NREM1 stage of sleep, will guide your dreams. You will dream about what we are suggesting you to dream. You will have your dreams enhanced, and then you will wake up with more creative ideas. And of course, a lot of examples of something like covert visual special attention. I do not need to move my head or my eyes. I don't even need to blink. I can just stare straight on that exit sign and tell exactly what is happening in the first row on my left and on the first row on my right, without, again, use of any cameras. And of course, we use as an input for BCIs your focus, attention, desire, imagination, emotion. The mere fact of me putting an image of a coffee will again spike your attention by several percent, even if you are not a coffee drinker. <laughs> In the lab, we have explored multiple scenarios. Robot control, 
brain-to-brain -brain communication, erasing short-term memories while you sleep for PTSD treatment, to name just a few. Here is just a set of different sneak peeks. The DDoC project you have just seen is a first-of-its-kind wireless, fully mobile system which is ice-free to interact with the patients who need more of their assistive care. The dog, the robot, can bring groceries, different shopping bags, open their door, etc. Space, another example, and another technology that will be out there fully available before AGI will become a reality. DCI is a key enabler for this technology, where we would want to understand the state of the person in cooperative space in a limited environment where there is no gravity. We do this work in collaboration with NASA and Massachusetts General. One of our projects just flew on Axiom 2 missions this past May in Florida to ISS. And of course, in addition to science, we also fully embrace magic. Harry Potter. We build the system, we call it the thinking cap. Instead of putting you to one of the houses, it tells you what you're thinking about. And we use it for enhancing the growth mindset in schools, and we also use it for improving academic performance. And just in case you do not like Harry Potter, haven't met a person just yet, but just in case, it can be any universe. And finally, last but not least, for people who have the most challenging of their times, incurable diseases like advanced stages of ALS, where there is no more voice, there is no more eye movement, there is no more movement whatever, but brain activity is available and functioning. We use this system to allow those patients to communicate with their loved ones and with the hospital staff. We literally ship that pair of glasses and an app, we will give a phone if you need one, but that's it, that's what, it goes to the user. And we design, thank you, we design the system together with the caretakers from the get-go. We call this inclusive design. But this project and none of the other previous projects would not be possible without amazing team, so thank you, the team. <laughs> and my takeaway message for you, Humans need to become objects and not subjects of interaction. It's in your power to truly leverage your user's brain, as well as your own. And this is the key, not only for us striving as civilization, for our society, but also for our survival. Connect with me on Twitter, and if you liked all the fictional references I have put in this presentation, check our latest project and then find me and tell me what was your favorite fictional universe. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Natalia. It was incredible to see just how much all of this next generation technology is rapidly approaching day-to-day -day wearability and usability. Now, next up, we have Michelle Cortese, who is an augmented and virtual reality designer and educator from New York City. Now, Michelle describes her talk as getting an entire 14-week class on how to transition to extended reality design, all compressed in 20 minutes and without doing any homework. Now, I don't know about you all, but my immediate thought was, please sign me up. So Michelle's talk will give you a focused look on what makes designing for extended reality different from other product design, including all of the pieces and workflows needed to get started. Please, let's give it up for Michelle. Hello, everyone. So I'm Michelle Cortese, and this is Leaving Flatland, Easing the Transition to XR Design. It is a condensed 20-minute version of a class that I teach at NYU that unpacks the hard skills and the ethical considerations of VR design. And it was very much specifically architected so that 2D designers could more easily transition into XR. 
So in this session, we're going to ask the question, can an absolutely brilliant audience of design thinkers, that's all of you, uh, speed run a 14-week master's level XR design class in just 20 minutes? So let's get started. We had a lot to get through. Let's find out. So first, you want to transition into XR design? Well. To be a virtual, augmented, or mixed reality designer, or XR for extended reality, which comprises all three, it's not enough to learn the hard skills. It's also our responsibility to prime ourselves for the human impact of our work. It'd be really easy for me to just get up here and tell you how to you know, do your 2D layouts and transition them to Unity, or how to make sure Unity panels can be designed in Figma with one-to-one -one resolution. But that's not the point. Design for Immersive Technologies introduces new and ambiguous ethical and experiential concerns that designers should know upfront, or we're going to end up with the same old Web 2.0 mistakes, but strapped to our faces. Yeah. Uh, so let me begin the way that I do with my NYU students. Every year, on the first day of the semester, I ask them to all close their eyes and envision a fictional, futuristic anecdote. And then I ask if they can name all the ways that the embodied technology in the story exploited the user. So this is that fictional anecdote. So please close your eyes if you, if you want to. You can close your eyes and envision this. So as part of a smart city contract, your municipality has opted towards transitioning all wayfinding street signage. That means street names, parking reg regulation, etc into digital formats. Most people already use their AR glasses, personal devices, or in-car dashboard displays to navigate the city, so the change seems natural. You update your AR glasses, purchasing a model that supports real-time wayfinding. Uh, their frame rate is much higher than your last pair, so you're still adjusting, but the device monitors your eye movement to slowly build a more comfortable experience for you. One morning, realizing you need to mail a package, because we still mail things, you decide to put their navigation promises to the test. So you search for the nearest post office, vaguely recalling that it's about 10 minutes away, you confirm the address on your phone, hit enter, and then a display activates on your glasses, pointing you towards the door. You leave the house, following the path indicated on the glasses, it's virtually projected onto the sidewalk. During your walk, you might notice virtual street signs and information about passing businesses on your glasses. Realizing the route has taken you in a slightly different path than you normally use, you notice a new coffee shop using their digital storefront to offer grand opening deals. You arrive at the post office after a 15-minute walk, dreaming of coffee. Uh, I just realized that I forgot to do an animation, so we're all going to wait 10 seconds. But while we do that, I'm going to tell you that usually at this stage, I would ask my students to tell me exactly what they think um, were all of the exploitation things that they noticed in the story. But this is a speed run, so I'm just going to give you the answers. Also, you can open your eyes now if you haven't already. So these are the risks that are in this particular story. There is disruption. Advertisements obscure the user's field of view. There's inequity. The user, if the user cannot afford the glasses, they cannot see the signs. There's invasion of privacy. The user's biometric data was actually non-consensually tracked. And there was behavior manipulation. The user was actually detoured to get impressions for a shop front. These are just four issues of many. They're not the entire scope of the risk, but the exercise is effective because it introduces the lens through which my students should view the entire class, that seemingly innocuous advances in technology can easily skew or exploit our daily lives, but that many of these issues can be mitigated by design choices if we're willing to educate ourselves on the risks. So the syllabus I created combines design strategies that I acquired through about nine years of working in VR, six at Meta Reality Labs, aka Oculus, and through the development of multiple design systems for VR, including the one for Horizon Worlds, and some contributions to several design, uh, XR design publications. But generally, my work just focuses on building more equitable XR experiences through a lot of trauma-informed design systems and frameworks. I currently lead a team of prototypers focused on AR and VR input and interactions at Meta Reality Labs. And if you're familiar with my work at all, it's probably the papers and book chapter that I co-authored uh, between 2018 and 2020 with colleague Andrea Zeller on proxemic consent-driven frameworks uh, for designing safer social VR spaces, and it was inspired by our early system work on Horizon Worlds. But all of my time as an XR design manager and designer and educator, I've really noticed that designers 
largely struggle with just three things when they're shifting from 2D and mobile and web, et cetera, into XR. They struggle with number one, learning the hard skills. Number two, working on nascent things with uncertain outcomes. And number three, confusion about the broad and multidisciplinary scope of the work and all of its implications. So I find that education programs that only cover the hard skills, like using a game engine, are always gonna fall short of addressing all of these onboarding anxieties and creating XR designers who can confidently mitigate the potential harms of this technology. So, to unpack the ambiguity and the hard skills and the big giant scope of XR design, this session and my NYU class steals its structure from something called hedonomics. And that is a branch of ergonomic science that facilitates pleasurable human technology interaction. Hedonomics has actually risen up in recent decades um, as the way that we use devices has changed dramatically. Previously, ergonomics existed to optimize device use and efficiency in work-specific contexts. But more recently, through a vast evolution in the use of personal devices, you know, our always-on, always-at-work culture that we all love so much, uh, hedonomics has emerged to propagate pleasurable human-computer interaction across all areas of life, not just work efficiency, which is an important difference now. So at the core of hedonomics is a promise to deliver genuine fulfillment of human needs, which necessitates hierarchical goals to comprehend human motivation. So we use the hedonomic pyramid, which we have above, which is very similar to Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. And it stacks the following needs, safety, functionality, usability, pleasure, and individuation. Through this hierarchy, we're able to break up the very large and very ambiguous task of developing new standards for immersive design into much smaller pieces and sectioning off our thinking into regions of the pyramid and then mapping out guidance for each. The result of all of this is a checklist of industry-tested design principles and specs and practices that are built to serve as a quick start guide for XR design. So we're gonna work our way through the pyramid now, starting from the bottom. So we begin at the base with safety, because it's really critical that we start with a solid understanding of the mitigation strategies that contribute to safer XR experiences. So here are four design techniques for mitigating feelings of endangerment in XR experiences. We really should, number one, establish behavior expectations for device use, especially for multi-user ex experiences. Number two, allow users to define their device and experiential preferences before any high-risk use can even occur. Number three, allow people to opt in or out of unfamiliar embodied interactions. And number four, provide quick action remediation tools for tough situations. Because when something scary or high stress is happening on a device that is strapped to your head and plugged directly into your senses, escape needs to be fast and simple. At this point, you might be wondering if XR even poses real safety risks, because it's not real, per se. So, well, first, VR harassment. <laughs> yeah. Damn, it happened right before I said it. So first, VR harassment is definitely a thing. If you don't believe me or you don't know, there's plenty of articles out there on the internet. I wrote some of them myself. They're there. Go find them if you haven't seen them. Second, when we're in a virtual reality experience or engaged in AR overlay, interactions with digital entities can feel very, very real. And this, ex this sensation of experiencing a virtual body or surrounding as your own is called virtual embodiment. And to understand how this feels, we're gonna talk about this stuff on screen right now, which is a video of the rubber hand illusion, um, which is a famous experiment in which a person will observe a rubber hand, as you see there, or a virtual hand in the VR versions of the experiment, and they'll observe that in front of them, while the fake hand is stimulated at the same time as their real hand. Their real hand is hidden away during all of this, so they just look at the fake hand. And as the test continues, they begin to adopt the fake hand into their bodily experience. This happens so much so to the point that at some point in the study, somebody will come up with a sharp object, usually a knife, as you can see, I think it's a fork in this one, and they'll go to 
threaten the hand, to go to stab it. And generally speaking, the subject always pulls away in fear because at that point, they've adopted the hand into their body. So as a person in VR, you know logically that what is happening to your avatar is not actually happening to your real body. But just having this false extension of yourself produces transcendent effects. When your virtual self is threatened or violated, your brain can momentarily perceive it as being incredibly real. So, on to the next level. So once we've established this um, stable foundation of safety in our XR experiences, function is absolutely key. And the premise here is really, really, really simple. It's that XR experiences, just like any other, should fulfill a basic need. So, we should, number one, inform users of all behavioral effects and risks, as there can be many. Number two, be transparent and informative when asking for attention, because attention means a lot more when a device is plugged directly into your senses and covering your field of view. And finally, number three, let people see under the hood. Specifically, let them in on the details of how your app works and the data that it uses. Why? Well, think about the way that Web 2.0 offered us plenty of apps with dark algorithms and exploitative functions. Well, XR apps explore, expose new and novel risks. The immersive and illusory nature that we just talked about of XR devices and applications introduces new and powerful forms of behavioral manipulation and can induce powerful negative emotional responses. For example, the Proteus effect describes the tendency for people to be affected by their digital representations. And that actually can include avatars and social media personas and more. Users can be affected to the degree that their behavior is actually changed by the characteristics of their avatars. In studies, it has been proven that people given monstrous avatars are more likely to express errant behavior, while users given sexualized avatars are more likely to exhibit self-objectification. These responses even occur when subjects are 100% fully aware that they are in an immersive experience. It doesn't matter. Your brain tricks you. OK. Moving on to the next level of the pyramid. So once our users' safety and functionality needs have been fulfilled, we can focus on ensuring that our XR experiences are easy to use and feel materially satisfying. This section is the closest match in scope to traditional ergonomics. So to ensure that our XR applications are easy to interact with, it's really important that we simulate healthy embodiment by, number one, using familiar sensations uh, and true-to-life interactions that will limit motion sickness and avoid eye strain. Number two, keep panels at a comfortable distance, which means usually keeping them at eye level between 0.5 and 2 meters away within the user's field of view. Number three, ensure accessible input modalities and easy-to-execute gestures to avoid unnecessary physical effort. Number four, design interactions to have clear, symbolic, and timely feedback. And number five, represent the user's hands, controllers, and body positions in a way that averages their actual and expected positions. This one really just means that you want the user's hands to appear where the user expects them to be based on you know, their real life position and the physics of the scene and not just their precise coordinates. So in the video on screen, taken from Meta's recent launch of direct touch capability on Quest, you might notice much of the parameters that I just mentioned. The interaction embodies a simple real-world behavior. The panel sits at an easy-to-reach arm's length away. The touches have clear feedback, and the hand never passes through the panel that it's touching, even if the user's hand in real space goes just a little bit past it. You might notice similar patterns in the Apple Vision Pro's Vision OS. The way that XR devices are able to port directly in and out of our senses and often employ our existing human input devices, like our hands, as controllers necessitates new UX rules for usability. In this new reality, the capabilities of our real-world bodies deeply skew our expectations for what XR interaction behavior and quality should be. So if an interaction fails to meet too many of our real-world sensory expectations, we can feel sick or tired or disoriented or even out of our bodies. OK. So once we have established this baseline of safety and function and usability, we can incorporate pleasure into our designs. Um, so this level of the hedonomic pyramid satisfies the human desire to be pleasured by aesthetic stimuli. 
We should always hold ourselves accountable to ensure that XR user interfaces have high visual standards. This isn't a place to cheap out. So to do this, we really must, number one, understand the device color profiles from AR to VR and from device to device. There's lots of difference. Number two, understand display types. For example, AR is additive, you know, and VR is full immersion. Number three, control the use of typography and always render it in a way that is at a readable size and weight per device, which often starts at 14 millimeters high per meter away. And finally, use a Figma to Unity pipeline. So what is a Figma to Unity pipeline, you ask? Well, as any of you might know, if you've tried to take the jump and haven't quite felt like safe in, in XR design, is that one of the most confusing things about starting out in VR design or XR design as a 2D or web or graphic designer is that it feels like all your old typography, legibility, and sizing rules are now useless. But that's not true. They're not. You can still use all that stuff. There's a conversion metric that we use in XR panel design that allows you to create layouts in Figma or other preferred <laughs> options if you want and ensure that the, the resolution that you see in Figma is the resolution that you will see when you restructure your layout in a game engine for XR. So what does some of that look like? Well, the game engine that I use is Unity. Some people like to use Unreal. And the conversion metric that I like to use is one pixel at one X equals one millimeter at one X meters away. So a 400 by 600 millimeter panel that sits at one meter distance from the user in VR is exactly 400 by 600 pixels if exported at one X. Uh, if you need to place your panel further back in space, that's fine. You just change your export resolution then. And you change that by the number of meters away the panel will be. So for example, you want your panel to be two meters away, you do a 2x export. To determine what text sizes will be readable, uh, we have lots of rules, but you can kind of apply a lot of standard rules for the size, pixel resolution, and export scale that you're working in. To migrate your UI from Figma to Unity at that point, you can just export PNG assets exactly as you would when you're designing for a mobile app. This is a key photo op page, I think, but I'll get back to it too. Um, well, why does it matter? Well, one part of that is that We've been talking a lot about how the brain perceives a lot of this stuff, and one part is that the parts of the brain responsible for aesthetic responses to beautiful art actually overlap with those that handle evaluating objects of evolutionary importance, like food and sex. So as designers, we have to really carry on this legacy of pushing our interfaces to be as beautiful and inspiring as possible. I'm gonna stop that there, because I don't think I actually have to sell this group on that. But in order to pursue this, like, to make this pursuit of beauty, it's a little different because we have to pursue it slightly differently. We have all these different device resolutions, color profiles, display types, field of views, panel proximities, etc. So the parameters that we use to make design different in XR are a little bit different, but it's okay. And, and in fact, I usually like to remind people that like, you know, we love bright whites in our layouts a lot of the time, but overly bright and text-dense interfaces have actually been proven to worsen simulator sickness in VR. Okay, so finally we have reached the last level of the pyramid. It is individuation. This is the headiest one. We're going to talk about how immersive experiences can and should make our real lives and actual selves better. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, individuation also sits at the highest level and refers to the realization of a person's potential, the de desire to become one's fullest self. XR identities should also empower such expression and self-actualization. So to ensure individuation in VR, it's incredibly important that we, number one, allow users to create identities that are representative and expressive, and number two, ensure interoperability and ownership of a user's profile and virtual self. Individuation, as suggested by the term itself, manifests differently for all people. So as we build this generation of uh, immersive XR experiences, we must be acutely aware of the variety of expressions and identities that they're able to accommodate. 
As noted before, the immersion of XR experiences and interactions gives them the ability to manipulate our behavior and blend with our sense of self. So if we're ever going to use these things on a regular basis, they must cater to our human needs for expression and agency. And that begins with building XR applications that are open standard, trustworthy, and interoperable. Building an infrastructure of self-sovereign identity where users are the owners of their virtual identity as well as the very sensitive biometric data that these devices use to operate. FYI, if you did not know this already, that data is as unique as a fingerprint and incredibly hard to anonymize. Okay, that's all the principles we have for this session. Uh, I'm gonna close out with a really fast recap of every primary risk and solution approach for all the levels. This is a great photo slide if you just want the one slide takeaway of the primary features of the class. So, for individuation, remember that virtual identity impacts our sense of self, so allow self-expression and identity ownership. For pleasure, remember that garish XR interfaces can hurt your brain, so translate your UI principles to new display needs. For usability, remember that bad interactions can actually cause simulator experience, so simulator sickness, so you want to emulate um, all of your IRL interactions as much as you can. For function, remember that immersion can cause behavior manipulation, so be transparent and be informative. And for safety, remember that virtual threats can feel real, so ensure predictability, consent, and remediation. And finally, just remember that this framework is not an end-all, be-all. It's just a lens through which we can simplify the process of learning and a new design craft, particularly one with a host of ethical and experiential implications. And we do so by chopping up human needs into little categories and highlighting design principles and methods for each. Oh, and before I forget, remember that one pixel equals one millimeter if it's one millimeter away. And that is a wrap. So thank you so much. <laughs>